Okay. Okay. There. Can people hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Sophie, we're actually yeah. seeing your presentation screen. So you see the next slide. So oh. in PowerPoint, you know, you've got that option where if you've got your displaying, then it, people will see just your slide, but you will see the next slide and your slide. Yeah. If you hit Let's function, see. if you hit function five, it'll it'll take. It. Uh, oops. Oh. Yeah, so you actually function five, Brian. This is uh, the. This is the presenter's notes that she's able to see. Oh, okay. You know, so that when you're up on the podium, this is what you see while everybody else just right. sees the main slide. So, uh, which one? Sorry, which one do I press? <laughs> sorry, guys. Um, you know, I can't tell you by looking at those. Uh, I, I think, think it's you not. Can you just go to your regular PowerPoint. Oh, uh, can you see your other, just the slide? Do you have two screens? Oh, I see what's happening here. I'm going to pull out my uh, one second. You That's can choose happening. which screen you want to, yeah. Or you yeah, can this choose my, which screen. Does that help? Um, <laughs> it's coming. There you go. You got it. Hey, sorry about that. Thanks for that, Victoria, because actually my, I have a second screen, so that's why my computer wasn't quite happy. So great. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I think Victoria had a really good segue into my presentation here today. Um, yes, I've been working on this for a while, um, but it's been uh, very encouraging to see this past year or so, the momentum that's been gathering uh, by, uh, driven by many people in particular, I'm just top of mind, Elisa Roberts um, out of North Vancouver. Um, there's a couple other people, their names will come to me in a, in a bit, but there's a, certainly some key people that have been very actively doing more advocacy on behalf of this issue with secondary redemptive poisoning of wildlife. Um, so, I, and I, I'm really grateful about that because that's really um, made a big, big difference. Um, uh, so what I'm hoping to do here today is talk a bit about the anticoagulant rodenticides, uh, why they are an issue, uh, look at how these rodenticides move up the food chain, um, both in an agricultural landscape and an urban context, uh, which are two dominant landscapes in, in the lower mainland, and then talk a little bit about solutions and, and how we can potentially move forward from, from this. So I'll just jump right into the problem, and that is this guy right here. We humans do not like rats. Uh, it's right up there with spiders as being one of the most hated species in the world, and it certainly triggers our more sort of um, responsive side of our, our, our um, I guess, behaviors. Uh, and there's it's good reason for this. Uh, rats have certainly been responsible for giving us uh, several diseases over the centuries. Uh, they also do a lot of damage both to our agricultural fields uh, and also store grain and our structures. Uh, these are just some annual estimates and I suspect they might be a little outdated at this point, but it just gives you an idea of the um, damage that these rodents do on an annual basis, and this does not include the cost of rodent control. So as humans, we have naturally, over the centuries, tried to control these rodents uh, the best we can, uh, various different techniques, some more successful than others. Um, a little fun fact for the day, when Teddy Roosevelt was the president of the White House, believe the turn of the 20th century, there was a huge rat infestation in the White House. And apparently he spent a lot of time down there with his Jack Russells chasing uh, and hunting these rats uh, to the extent that there's a specific Jack Russell um, subbreed that's called the Teddy Roosevelt, uh, Jack Russell Terrier to this day. And it's a shorter, stubbier one apparently. 
I think we've all, um, we're all familiar with the snap traps, um, trying to set them without getting them on our fingers. And then we have the poisons. Now the big breakthrough with the poisons came in the 1940s when we got the anticoagulant rodenticides. Uh, the first generation rodenticides, uh, the most commonly known is warfarin, uh, but there's also chlorofastinone and diafastinone. Um, and these are the active ingredients, so not to be confused with the product names. Uh, they, when they were introduced, were fairly successful in controlling rats. However, resistance did grow in certain rat populations because these rodenticides um, have to be fed on several times before a rat dies, which builds that likelihood of resistance. So in the 1970s, the second generation anticoagulant rodenticides came on the market with the active ingredients bradificum, difathlon, and bromodialon. I apologize for these long, terrible names, and I've heard them pronounced in a lot of different ways, so I'm sure, <laughs> I'm not sure even if I'm pronouncing them right. But the key thing with the second generation anticoagulant rodenticides, the SCARs, is that they are more toxic and they're single feed killing, which means that a rat only needs to feed on the bait once before it um, essentially uh, succumbs from, from eating it. And the way that these anticoagulant rodenticides work, in, in short, looking at the physiological effects, is that it stops the vitamin K production in your cells. Uh, essentially, you need the vitamin K as part of the process of breaking fibrinogen down to fibrin. And without this happening, you, uh, your body cannot um, essentially regulate the viscosity of its, its blood. The blood cannot, um, essentially, you, the blood will become thinner and thinner. And what happens is, is that you would either bleed out if you get a cut or you um, will bleed out internally. Um, and if you noted, the first generation anticoagulant rodenticides, they've been on the market since the 1940s, the second generation since the 1970s. So these pesticides have been used for close to well, 80 to 50 years. And the SCARs, the second generation ones in particular, are the most commonly used rodenticide globally to control rats. So it's been fairly successful at, at controlling rats. And one of the key things that has made them so successful is the fact that they are what we call a slow reacting compound, which means that the onset of symptoms can take up to five to seven days after a rat has consumed the poison. And that's the key. Uh, rats are what we call neophobic, and they're, they're smart. I mean, they've pretty much followed us to every corner of the world and created havoc for us during the way. Um, and they're very, very careful at figuring out what they should and should not eat. Um, so the fact that the onset of symptoms is delayed makes it so that they do not associate eating the poison and then dying, and, and neither do their, their bodies. Like they're, so the challenge here, though, lies also in the fact that they are slow reacting compounds. And I'll get back to that in a second. But alongside the fact that they're slow reacting, the anticoagulant rodenticides are more and more being recognized as PBTs. Um, they're persistent bioaccumulative toxic compounds. Um, and the reason for this designation is they're persistent. Bradificum, which is a second generation anticoagulant rodenticides, half time in the liver, which this is where typically the anticoagulant rodenticides will accumulate is in the liver, is 307 days. And this is similar to other legacy compounds such as DDE, which is a derivative of DDT, and uh, PCBs. Uh, as an example, the first generation rodenticide Chlorofastinone's half-life is 35 days. You can see it's less persistent. It's bioaccumulative. So going back to the fact that 
It has is a slow reacting compound. The challenge here is that before the rat has any onset of symptoms, it can go back and eat more rodenticides than what is needed for a lethal dose, keeping in mind that the second generation compounds are single feed toxins. And secondly, too, um, there's that lag time before the symptoms take into effect where it can then be consumed by a predator. And over the last, I'd say 15 years or so, there's been um, quite a significant increase in the number of publications on this issue, uh, especially from North America and, and from Europe, showing how uh, these compounds are moving up the food chain. And they're also extremely toxic. Um, you do not need a lot of this compound for it to be lethal uh, compared to other uh, pesticides. So I thought I'd just go over this because um, these because it has been recognized that these compounds, the anticoagulant rodenticides, are having an effect on the ecosystem um, in an attempt to reduce this in 2014, which is now six years ago, although this was part of a phase-in period, there has been, I guess, new <laughs> since it's six years old, um, regulations that pertain to anticoagulant rodenticide use, both here in Canada and also in the United States. And what has changed is that the first-generation anticoagulant rodenticides, so those are the less toxic and persistent ones, are the ones that you and I can go and purchase at our hardware store. Um, they have to be prepackaged in a temper-resistant bait station. You can't just buy the pellets anymore. Um, and they can be used inside and, and outside your house. The, from bromodylon, which is a second-generation anticoagulant rodenticide, is the only second generation anticoagulant rodenticide which is allowed to be used outside. And it's only allowed to be used by a pest control operator or a farmer. So you have to have a farm card in order to purchase this product. Although there are a couple of loopholes there that I can get back to if you're interested. Um, Bromodylon has to be in a tamper-resistant bait station too. It has to be fastened alongside the perimeter of buildings or long fence lines uh, up to 100 feet, 30 meters from a building. And then the two other SGARs, the Brodificum and the Difathlon, can only be used inside. Uh, these are the most toxic and persistent ones again, only accessible to farmers and pest control operators. So um, some of the sort of questions that we've had since the uh, changes in regulations, and there has been a phase out period, so um, stores can purchase, sorry, sell whatever they have in storage. Uh, but one of the sort of key challenges that we've seen with this regulation is um, there is some uh, need for clarity uh, as far as what constitutes the structure. For example, I work with barn owls. A lot of the barn owls that I study like to live in, in old derelict barns, such as the one in the upper right corner. And, and indeed, a lot of other wildlife call that home too. So the question is, well, does that constitute a structure uh, or does it have to be a building that's completely sealed up in order for you to be able to put uh, rodenticide in it? So. Again, so there is certain, certainly some need for clarifications. Uh, so one of the things that I've been working on with, uh, as a contractor with Environment Canada is the monitoring of anticoagulant rodenticide residues in our local raptors. And, and this has been important, um, uh, it's particularly with the new regulations coming in because we have then also been wanting to see, well, are there any changes in the exposure rate? In these raptors. Um, and I'll go over this carefully. So what we're seeing here is pretty much all the raptors that have been tested since 1988 to 2016. Uh, we're very fortunate to have one of the biggest databases 
uh, 560 raptors have been tested over this time period uh, for rodenticides. I think only the UK has a longer running uh, residue database. Um, and uh, they were actually the earliest samples there from 1988 to the mid 90s were tested retroactively from frozen livers. Um, and what we're seeing here in this graph is the percentage of individuals with detectable residues of second generation anticoagulant rodenticides. So not the first generation ones, but only the second generation ones, which are more persistent and toxic. Uh, and some of the key things to note here is that um, you can see the numbers of tested are in the bars. And you can see we've naturally focused on the owls. So the barred owl, the great horn, and, and the barn owls are the ones we have the most samples from. Um, but it's interesting to note um, that we're also seeing exposure in raptors that don't typically eat rodents or aren't really rodent focused at all, such as merlins, uh, sharp shin hawk, cooper sock, peregrine falcons. These are raptors that primarily consume songbirds. Um, and the testing of these started in the mid to late, uh, sort of 2005 to 2008. Uh, we started to test these raptors and realized that we were also seeing exposure in, in, in these guys. Uh, another thing to note too is how uh, the proportion of barred owls and also the number of great horn owls with, with higher concentrations in them. If you look at the dashed lines, uh, these um, are individuals with, with a fairly high concentration of anticoagulant rodenticides in their livers. You can see um, that these two owl species in particular are, are, are um, particularly affected by rodenticides, secondary poisoning. So the question then begs, well, are these other raptors consuming rodents or is the food chain becoming, uh, are these becoming uh, compounds becoming pervasive in our food chain. Um, and there are a lot of unfortunate outcomes when it comes to secondary poisoning. Um, this is an individual that came into OWL. I was actually out there that day because I was blood sampling live raptors for rodenticides uh, and it came in dead. There was no visible signs of any impact in injury. It was a healthy um, great horned owl as far as physiologically. Um, no signs of any injuries and, and, and in good health, a good healthy weight too. Uh, the liver was tested and it did, was concluded that it had died from rodenticide poisoning. So I guess the linkage I'm trying to make here is one thing is the exposure, but what, you know, we, there are the ones that have fatal outcomes from exposure, unfortunately. Uh, and then also another sort of challenge that we're trying to wrap our heads around, uh, I see, I say we loosely, because quite a few people are, are working on this, both in Europe and North America, is the potential sublethal effect from being exposed to rodenticides. Um, most of those raptors that have been tested um, in that uh, figure I showed you were admitted dead or, or dying to our local rehab facilities uh, for other reasons than outright rodenticide poisoning. A lot of road mortality, window strike, some starvation, um, but these individuals were found with, with high levels of anticoagulant rodenticides in their systems, which begs the question, well, what are the potential sublethal effects from being exposed to rodenticides? Uh, these owls, as you're well aware, <laughs> as a naturalist group, are struggling with several threats in our environment, loss of habitat, um, fragmentation from, from roads. Um, and, and so, you know, if they're operating on less than 100% because they're not feeling great, because they've been consuming um, exposed rodents, well, does that make them more likely to getting hit by cars flying into windows or, or not being able to hunt at all and, and starve to death? So. There's certainly a, a lot of uh, questions around the ultimate approximate causes of death when uh, rodenticide residues uh, are detected in the livers of deceased individuals. So, uh, as I mentioned in the graph bar, what is going on here? Are these uh, rodents, sorry, these raptors that um, typically eat rats, it's easy to see the linkage, obviously, the rats 
the house mice go into the bait station and, and then they get consumed by the, the barred owls and, and the great horn and the barn owls. Um, however, we were also seeing exposure in our peregrines, our merlins, our cooper's hawk, our sharpsins. Uh, so are they eating rats too or are we seeing potentially, oops, sorry about that, uh, a wider contamination of the food chain? Um, and I think the consensus is based on the studies that have been done here in North America and also in Europe is that um, it's probably the latter that's happening. Um, invertebrates like to go in and feed on the bait. If farmers tell me this, um, they often have permanent baiting in and around farms, which I'll get back to in a little bit. Um, but often a lot of that bait doesn't get touched by rats, but it's rather covered in slugs that eat it. Um, and the thing with invertebrates is that they are physiologically different than us. And the rodenticides do not affect them in the same way as they affect us. They do not have the same, or seemingly do not seem to have the same physiological effects from eating this. Um, and we've documented birds going in and, and pecking on the bait stations. Anything in theory that's able to access, go into this bait box, um, you know, squirrels, other, um, other rodents, non-target rodents such as field mice, deer mice, uh, have also been documented going into these bait stations and consuming baits. So it doesn't take a lot of imagination to see how, again, pervasive these contaminants can become come in the food chain. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, one of the studies that were done in Spain on Grand Canary on the Grand Canaries showed that kestrels, which they're typically is an insectivore um, on the island, was the one raptor that had the highest residues of anticoagulant rodenticides in their system, just as an example. So uh, another example I just wanted to quickly show you of this, uh, it was a study that was done in the Netherlands um, back in 2016. Uh, it was featured in the Pest magazine, a UK Pest magazine, and uh, I had to scan this, I'm sorry for the quality, but uh, the key take home message I wanted to give you was that they put a bunch of bait boxes around um, in different landscapes and they had cameras on these bait boxes and were monitoring what was visiting the bait stations. And um, what they found was, at least in this study, uh, as you can see here, I guess maybe the chart, the pie chart on the bottom right is the most revealing one, but mostly slugs and snails were visiting these bait stations uh, and a high proportion of birds, also house mice and unidentified mice, but certainly not, uh, the majority of them were not visited by rats or, or house mice. Actually no rats in this study. So shifting gears a little bit, um, now that I've sort of given you a little bit of a background in the anticoagulant rodenticides, um, sort of, I wanted to move on uh, to um, the barn owl, which I've been fortunate to have been able to study since 2006. Uh, as many of you are aware, it's uh, closely associated with um, the agricultural landscape in the Lower Mainland. Um, it's what we call an uh, open grassland bird. Um, it's found in areas that are dominated by grasslands, marshlands, wetlands, hay fields. Uh, and they're well adapted to hunt in this environment. They have the longest wings of all the owls relative to their body size, so they're quite efficient hunters on the wing. Um, but what we have been finding for these guys too, uh, as you saw, um, we actually have the most samples from barn owls over the years, uh, 164, and I'm sure that's not the most up-to-date up number of tested barn owls. Um, but these guys hunt in agricultural fields, but they also nest and, and roost inside buildings. Uh, the majority of them do nest in, in, barn, uh, in boxes inside or outside um, buildings. Um, and what we have been finding is that the agricultural landscape um, is certainly, um, uh, there is certainly high usage of rodenticides in the, in the agricultural uh, landscape. Um, and to illustrate this, 
Um, a lot of the farmers, as I mentioned, permanently bait with verdenticides. Um, and the reason for this is that a lot of them follow very stringent food safety requirements, which is given by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. They oversee that, the, and that's federal. Um, and it doesn't state that they have to use redenticides, but because it's such an intensive monitoring program and the farmers have a lot of other things they have to keep track of too, they often source this out to a third party pest control operator, which defaults to using permanent, um, using redenticides permanently uh, around the perimeter of, of buildings. Um, and if you layer that with the fact that our agriculture has changed a lot over the decades, um, it's gone from uh, a grass-based agriculture, vegetable-based, to being more greenhouse and, and berry production, both of which are quite intensive uh, crops. Um, uh, if you start thinking about it, if you start putting bait stations every 10 meters around greenhouses, that's a really big footprint of, of redenticides, um, of redenticide usage in the agricultural landscape. And on top of that, too, uh, in berry fields, the field mouse, which is right below the barn owl there, which is the main prey item for barn owls by a long shot. Barn owls typically eat about 70 to 95% uh, field mice, a very important prey item for um, barn owls, but also other predators, um, red tails, um, I mean, eagles get them too, the other owls, coyotes, great blue herons, um, the field Vole, field mouse, Towns, Microtis, Townsendi, it's got many names, is one of the key prey items for, for these um, predators, is also targeted in, in berry fields um, because um, sometimes these field voles will inadvertently or on purpose chew on the roots of the berry bushes. Um, and this particularly happens in late fall and early winter. And because these berry bushes are kind of like grape wines, it takes a long time for them to mature and be productive. The farmers are protected of them, protective of them, and they will place bait stations, these T, PVC T bait stations. You might have seen them in berry fields, and they put bait in them to control the field mice, field voles in these fields. Um, and, and the challenge here is, well, as you know, we, our agriculture has changed a lot. We've certainly got way more blueberry fields. So again, the footprint of verdenticides out in the landscape has increased significantly with the rate of blueberry or berry production. Uh, and also, secondly, another challenge here is when I did a survey back in 2013, I surveyed over 100 farmers on their rodent control methods. Um, and what I did find was a lot of them were uh, inadvertently using the wrong type of redenticides outside. So uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, it, in outside in the field, actually you can only use first generation anticoagulant redenticides. But unfortunately, um, the farmers were unintentionally using the second generation products, the ones that were supposed to be inside only out in the field because they weren't discriminating between the different products which is a huge mistake when it comes to the anticoagulant redenticides. This is not twice as poisonous or, or persistent. This is on a logistical scale. The difference between the first generation products and the second generation products is it's uh, on a 10,000 fold scale. So uh, when these compounds get out into the agricultural landscape, it's, it's very, very concerning. So I just wanted to change Here's a little bit and talk about the urban landscape. Um, and barn owls are not only found within the agricultural landscape, but through my research, um, I've also been finding them in areas that were historically agriculture, but have agricultural, but have now become more and more uh, urban. Uh, and that's the good thing with these, um, or at least I find that's an encouraging thing with the barn owl is that they're somewhat adaptive. As Victoria mentioned in the beginning, there are species of at risk in uh, the lower mainland. We are at the northern extent of the Barn Owls Range here in British Columbia. Uh, but uh, they are, I would say, trying to persist in areas that are becoming extreme, increasingly urban. Um, and this is actually a, a real Barn Owl, by the way. This is not a, a fake a Photoshop picture. This is a Barn Owl from 
the UK that was a rehab owl that uh, when it went out on uh, an outreach event saw a young boy on um, a skateboard flew away from its handler and actually went and landed on the skateboard that the boy was um, uh, I guess playing with and as a result the handler of the barn owl seeing that the the barn owl had a keen interest in skateboards made this uh, little handmade skateboard for the barn owl which it uh, apparently used on on a frequent basis so um, I must admit I've never seen this myself out uh, monitoring barn owls at night in more urban environments but uh, I uh, through a radio telemetry study I did where I radio tagged some urban barn owls I uh, we documented them nesting under um, some of the main bridges into Vancouver. This is a, a batch here, actually a second clutch of barn owls because they can nest twice if it's uh, good conditions. So this is a picture from October taken of, of a batch of barn owls that's inside the bridge deck. So uh, taking advantage of the fact that the, the bridge deck design has made these sort of cavities for them to nest in. Uh, we also found them in uh, industrial buildings and in fairly urban areas. Um, this is North Richmond. Uh, you drive past this actually when you take the SkyTrain. Uh, they barn owls like tall structures with multiple openings and as long as there's a little bit of foraging habitat around, they seem to be able to persist. And that's what we actually found, which was fine, quite interesting. By radio tagging these barn owls, um, I just wanted to give you an example of this. Uh, just to locate you, this is um, North Richmond. Uh, this here is the um, 99, uh, just before the Oak Street Bridge, which is right up here. Uh, and these are the locations of, of one female barn owl that we radio tagged. And this is just a subset of where she was found. But the really interesting thing about this uh, female was um, the fact that um, she didn't just roost uh, like sleep in the daytime in a more urban area, but she also hunted within the urban environment. So she could have just flown a couple of kilometers east of here and, and been in the more agricultural areas of, of Richmond, but she was actually able to utilize the remaining uh, grassland, sort of patches of grass, I should say, within the urban uh, landscape. Um, and again, it shows you that when we are using these redenticides in an urban setting where the footprint of usage is, again, way higher than in, in an agricultural context, it actually has implications because wildlife is utilizing these areas. It's not only the barn owls, uh, you also see red tails in these areas, Cooper's hawks, you, the odd merlin, sharp shin, and then you have you know, the other wildlife, the mammals too, that come through. Um, so it doesn't take a lot of imagination to see that, well, you know, if every strata or condo building or commercial building is um, baited, uh, there's, you know, there is a, a huge issue here with exposing uh, wildlife to these toxic compounds. And not only that, but these urban owls, and this is true for the barred owl, the great horn, and the barn owl, because I monitored the diet of all three of them, they also, the urban owls eat more rats than their rural counterparts. Uh, and in particular, the barred owls, uh, which this figure illustrates right here, this is the proportion of rats in the diet of the barred owls, uh, and relative to the amount of urban development around where they live, and what you see, it's almost a linear correlation. Uh, and the barred owls, they can, they're very, very adaptive. They're generalists and uh, they can consume a lot of rats. And I'm sure this barred owl here that was caught on camera down in downtown Vancouver um, is pretty much probably just eating uh, big rats and, and maybe the odd pigeon. So again, the generalists are at greater risk of, of being exposed to these redenticides through secondary consumption of, of poisoned rodents. Um, and, and there are a lot of rats in the urban environment. I mean, Vancouver, uh, they say the rat population is, is uh, on the rise. This is just a picture a friend of mine took uh, at a backyard bird feeder in Vancouver one day. So as the young rats getting out and about. So there is a lot of food for our raptors out there. Uh, another example, uh, this is from Maple Ridge. Uh, a barred owl looks like it's waiting for its evening meal. Um, and 
these anticoagulant rodenticides are not only a risk to the owls that catch live rodents and kill them, but it's also a risk to our scavengers. Uh, if you remember from one of my first slides, I said that the second generation anticoagulant rodenticides half-life in the liver of um, a rodent is up to 300 days. Um, these dead rats that are not that have not been eaten but are just decomposing are also risk for our local scavengers. As you can see here, this bald eagle is carrying back the lower part of a rat, which is there's also a picture that's been taken in Vancouver. So to sum this up, um, looking at the bigger picture, and this is also pulling in um, information from from um, California too, where there's been a lot of work on, on these. Um, pathways of exposure, um, you can see there's a multitude of ways that our local wildlife is being exposed to rodenticides. And it's both through the consumption, the studies are showing it's both through the consumption of the target rodents, the rats and the house mice, but it's also equally from the fact that because these bait stations are out there permanently 365 days a year, placed every 10 meters or so, around the perimeter of buildings as is portrayed in this picture behind you. This is from Richmond. You can see the bait stations all along here. And Barnells would hunt this area at night because this was pretty much the only remaining grass area that they could hunt in this area. Um, these bait stations are also visited by our sparrows, the squirrels, and, and the non-target rodents such as field, sorry, the field mice, the deer mice, and so on. Um, and again, from California, they've shown that um, bobcats are, are being um, exposed to rodenticides through consuming um, both non-target and, and, and non-target prey and target prey, showing how pervasive again these contaminants are become in our food chain. Um, and finally, before I shift gears here, just to kind of bring the message home. Uh, this is another study that actually has been looking at rodenticide residues in badgers and fishers in British Columbia. And these individuals uh, are certainly in areas that are a bit more wild than in the lower mainland. You can see here the areas where they've been sampled. And the badgers were mostly roadkills and roadkill, unfortunately, because they are uh, very susceptible to getting hit on roads at night uh, when they're out and they don't see very well. But what we did find, uh, we're still working on writing this up, is that out of 30 tested badgers, 18% of them had the second generation compounds in their system. So about 60% exposure of badgers. And of the 12 fissures that were tested, so this was fissures uh, from trap lines, three of them had uh, second generation anticoagulant rodenticides in their systems. And, and again, just illustrating that this isn't just an urban lower mainland problem. We are also seeing this throughout uh, residue detections in uh, wildlife throughout British Columbia. So to sort of summarize this up, uh, it sort of then comes down to, well, what can we do? Um, and I think as individuals, as groups, as you know, part of a strata, I think it's really, really important that we change your practices around uh, rat control. Um, and a lot of the work I've been involved with is essentially bringing that home to residents and also working directly with, with farmers on ensuring that um, preventative measures are put in place before rodenticides are, are used. Um, as an example here, this, these outreach documents were produced last year for uh, residents. And another example, as I mentioned too, uh, the challenge we have is that in the agricultural setting where field voles are, are targeted, um, the challenge here is, you know, we, we need to reduce the footprint of rodenticides in the agricultural landscape because a lot of our wildlife lives there. Um, so one of the other projects I've been working on is essentially um, 
making these outreach videos and also working directly with blueberry farmers on how to identify moles because that's been the big challenge is that they see a rodent, they don't know what it is, they will put out the poison. Um, and in many cases, it's only deer mice, which actually do not damage the blueberry fields at all. So that's been a key thing is to make sure they know what rodents are in their fields uh, and also that they minimize wool damage through structural control, preventative measures. And then if that is not efficient enough, then, then how to effectively use rodenticides. Another component of this project um, is, I, I, which I kind of find to be <laughs> I, one of the sort of more fun aspects of this project rather, is the use of barn owls for agricultural pest control. Um, as I mentioned, barn owls are a field bowl specialist and a pair of barn owls can eat up to 2,500 field bowls in one year. They're free, they, you know, they stick around, they're non-territorial, so why not attract them to our agricultural fields, such as berry fields, to hunt these bowls? Um, and this has been done quite successfully in other areas. The example, the most successful area being in Israel, uh, as you can see here on the bottom left, um, as I said, barn owls are not territorial. You can see the density of boxes. Again, really favorable weather for the barn owls down there. Um, and they do quite well as far as batches go. If there's lots of food around, barn owls can reproduce quite well. They respond well to that. Um, as I mentioned, they can even have two batches in, in one year. So the idea has been to replicate this in British Columbia. And uh, I've been very fortunate to be able to work with um, a subgroup of the Delta Nats, the Cascade Box Group, and they've been amazing. Uh, they're volunteers. Uh, they've been building these boxes. Like I know we did a tally, and they've built over 100 Barnell boxes within the last, um, I think, nine years now. Uh, and they're still producing. I think they're doing a batch of six tomorrow morning. Uh, and we've been putting them up in. Uh, agricultural uh, fields along the perimeters in the hopes that they will help reduce uh, wool problems for farmers um, and then also ensuring that the farmers commit to not using rodenticides in those fields. And um, you know you can put up a box and you, you never know if someone's gonna you know call it home. Farmers often ask me well how you know how do we advertise for the for the home for the barn owls and I, I wish there was a secret to it but uh, we've been quite fortunate. A lot of the boxes we have put up have become occupied. Uh, this is an example of uh, actually from an organic blueberry farm in Abbotsford last year, so they don't have any choice but to uh, use um, owls potentially as, as a rodent control. They're not allowed to use rodenticides, but you can see here there's four owlets in this nest box. So. Um, and just sort of a little anecdote, because uh, you are a naturalist group, and the guys that are building these boxes are, are naturalists, and we, they found other uses for these nest boxes too, not only for barn owls, but their grandkids seem to like them. And I got this picture from the Cascade Box group. This is actually Peter Ward's, one of his grandkids. I'm sure some of you are familiar with him. And then the Abbotsford Mission um, naturalist group, a club has also been putting out boxes. Uh, they've been re really good at, at putting out boxes in and around Abbotsford. And they sent me this picture independently from the Cascade Box Group. And I'm not sure if you can see those little faces inside the boxes that they built. But that's also a group of grandkids inside the, um, the boxes. So these boxes are not only used for, for barn owls, but apparently also for um, making sure you know where your grandkids are. So to sum it all up, um, I apologize, the last two slides are a little text heavy, but I think it's really, really important to get this messaging across. So only two slides left here. But um, one of the sort of key things that I really believe in is the integrated pest management approach. And an integrated pest management approach is not a strategy to diminish the use of pesticides. It's, it's not that we want to uh, necessarily eliminate or redensify usage, but it's very, very important that when you are dealing with rodents, particularly rats, um, that 
you have a decision-making framework that utilizes the best management practice um, given the um, objective of reducing rodent damage. And in any circumstance, the least severe intervention method should be considered first and also a method that will be the most effective given the specific circumstances, which means that if the, all the farmers are defaulting, for example, to permanent usage of verdanticides in and around their buildings without considering any prevention, any cultural or physical um, or biological methods before the chemical method is applied, um, that is not dealing with this issue effectively uh, at all. And, and it is a, a big challenge. And, and um, it seems to be that redenticides is sort of the first line of defense of which uh, uh, many, unfortunately, I, I find, um, I, I do see examples uh, both in agriculture and urban settings where redenticides seem to be the first line of defense, where exclusion, you know, sealing up the buildings properly, ensuring there's no you know, food waste available for these rats it is not considered, or, you know, even keeping the grass around building short and not leaving a bunch of plywood up against your wall for the rats to, to be able to harbor in. So um, it's very, very important to, to have a plan in place when, when you're dealing with, with rats and not just defaulting to redenticides, because it has consequences for the environment and, and the wildlife at large. So again, um, it's very important that the obvious measures that will reduce the likelihood of infestation should be explored before redenticides are utilized. And again, sustainable control can only be achieved by reducing the rodent carrying the capacity of the environment. Food sources need to be removed. Ensuring that structures are sealed up uh, needs to be done before um, you know, you're realistically being able to reduce your rodent population on a, on a more permanent basis. Otherwise, they're just going to bounce back. Um, as we know, the reproductive output of rats is, is quite remarkable, and they're, and they're able, they followed us across the globe. They're, you know, they're, they're able to persist in, in, in many different areas, and it's, it's if you don't uh, do the preventative man, methods first, um, they're, you know, the the poisons are only a, a temporary relief, and in some instances, too, the temporary relief does not work because the rats become resistant to the rodenticides. So um, I think sort of in conclusion that long-term rodenticide baiting needs to be the exception and not the modus operandi, uh, which I find is um, being practiced uh, today. And with that, um, I would like to give a big thank you to everyone that's I worked with over the years, um, as Victoria mentioned, I've been working on this since, um, well, I've been studying barn owls since 2006, and I've been, I guess I'm a bit of a jack of all trades. I currently work as an independent, but also a lot with the Face of Valley Conservancy. Uh, and um, I was quite funny, actually, I'm working on a project right now where I'm testing this new trap from New Zealand, a bull trap. Um, the good nature trap. Many of you might be familiar with this, but I'm working with farmers to see if it can be useful in an agricultural setting as an alternative to rodenticides. Uh, and I've always been referred to as the rat lady, sorry, the owl lady, but today I was referred to as the rat lady. And I'm not quite sure what I feel, how I feel about going from owl lady to rat lady, but um, I, I, I guess it's okay. So with that, thank you so much for listening and I'm, I'm more than happy to take questions. Thank you, Sophie. This is Christina speaking. Hey. We want to thank you on behalf of everyone that's participating tonight. First of all, for coming across so calmly and put together, considering what happened yesterday and you were being without power till last night. So thank you for also for coming in and presenting to us tonight. And um, you know, I saw your first presentation, or not your first, but that one you did quite a while ago for at Burke Mountain Naturalist, and I've really seen how you have evolved and um, and and um, how you're now out in the field and, and you're getting the word out, and, and it's so very, very helpful. And it's really nice to hear that the I've seen the owl boxes, but it's great to see that the Naturalist Club can make a difference. 
Absolutely. And um, I know that our own group, and Victoria may be able to speak to this later on, uh, is certainly supporting the ban of rodenticides in our communities. And um, we'd love to know more if you have a chance to share with us a little bit later on. People are asking questions of what we can do as, as a club, what our members can do. So again, thank you very much. And uh, at this point, uh, we're gonna be taking questions. I see someone's raised their hand. So we would like you to put your question in the chat box and then I'll read the question to Sophie. So if you could do that, um, Pam, I see your hand is raised. Are you able to put your question in the chat box, please? And Sophie, could you stop sharing your screen and we'll, we'll, um, we, we can yeah. go. Up here, yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Christina, by the way. Yeah, thank you, that's fabulous. Okay, um, so there is a comment from Pam that she, from Pam Zevitt, and she, she mentions that she's seen several Cooper's hawks stalk and eat rats, including chasing them on the ground. So they may be taking advantage of their abundance in urban areas more than we realize. Yes, anybody, anybody, go ahead, Sophie. Um, yes, I'm, I, I certainly think the, the raptors that are able to persist in urban environments are certainly the ones that are more generalist. Then I'm, I'm sure if an opportune moment comes to, to eat a, a, you know, a sluggish or a, a, a young rat, then they will take it. So yeah, I'm not so surprised. <laughs> And this is a question from Daryl. Daryl says he's got bird feeders up at their residence and they've been attracting rats. And he's curious to know how, what you would recommend for controlling the rats. Yeah, that's, that is a tricky one. I, I know from experience too, wanting to feed the birds in my backyard that um, trying to do that and, and also deal with them. Um, uh, or trying not to feed the rats can be a bit of a challenge. Um, I think the key thing that I would recommend is, and I know it's a bit of a hassle, but uh, take the bird feeders in at night if possible. And also you can get, uh, I've seen them on Amazon where you can get the seed catchers that you can put underneath your, your bird feeder that can basically, uh, it's sort of um, it's sort of a mesh. It's, it's super light and you can order them online. Um, that you can attach to bird feeders so that uh, the residue feed does not land on the ground, but rather in the seed catch, which you then also can take in at night. Um, I know it requires a bit more of a, an effort, but that will absolutely greatly reduce your, uh, your rat problem. Um, so so Daryl was just commenting back. He said, sorry, that did not work with pine siskins because they throw the seeds everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a, I, um, I know it's a, it's a tricky one. I, I struggle. I actually, yeah, I struggle with that my, myself. Even having a compost, um, you know, you have to turn it a lot because the rats. I mean, they can get under concrete slabs. They can, you know, they can eat through metal um, mesh, for example. So. Yeah, I, I, I think the best thing would be to try and take it in at night. And um, I, yeah, I guess snap, snap traps in bait boxes could be an option. Uh, I look up the good nature trap from New Zealand. It's, if you Google good nature, um, that is an option uh, too. The thing with snap traps in bait boxes is that birds might actually go into them too. So you have to be careful where you put them. Mm -hmm. Another comment from Pam, um, and she mentions that it's not a question, but more a note about regulatory limitations of local governments and what they can and cannot ban. And it's limited to policy slash ban on city lands only. The province is the main regulator. Yes, and that's, I, it's been great to see that municipalities are, are taking a lead on, on banning rodenticide use on municipal land and, and Pamela has been quite an active voice in, in helping I think navigate this. Um, she's very knowledgeable on this issue too and, and certainly taking a keen interest and um, and she's absolutely right um, and it's and I think that's to the sense that I've got is that you, municipalities can 
only do so much, but we there also might but there also actually needs to be some provincial um, more effectively it would be some provincial legislation that would further regulate the uses of these rodenticides. And as an example, you are seeing similar um, you're seeing a very similar situation in California, for example, where it's unfolding there one step ahead of us where uh, they actually um, uh, they have the I guess the federal regulations, which I showed you earlier, which is under Health Canada in, in here, but is uh, the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States. But the uh, state of California has then, or um, they're trying to have stricter regulations that pertain only within California on these rodenticides. So um, we have the federal regulations, but there is no reason why we cannot have stricter provincial regulation when it comes to usage of those rodenticides. To follow up a comment on that same topic, Lindsay says that municipalities are also petitioning the province to ban rodenticides across the province. Through yeah. comment. Um, from Victoria, she's asking if SCARS, the acronym S-G-A-R-S, are PVT chemicals, why not regulate it federally, that is, removed from commerce? Yeah, that certainly that could be done. I mean, Health Canada oversees the um, regulations of the anticoagulant redenticides. Um, I, I know they are re-evaluating um, one of the SCARs right now, the difathlon, which is one of the ones that can only be used indoors. Um, but I, 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 yeah, I, I haven't, I, from my experience, I'm not, I'm there, I guess I'm not seeing I, I, the response that might be needed as from the, some from the, federally as far as responding to this issue perhaps like uh, they are but it's um it, it could be faster <laughs> yeah thank you uh this question is also from victoria she wants to know if bats are affected that's a really really good question and i actually uh was discussing that with um uh, diana pfeiffer from the island uh, and um, oh, I'm sorry, her name evades me. Actually, uh, about a couple of I think two weeks ago, um, I there has certainly been studies that have shown exposure in bats, not from British Columbia, uh, but from elsewhere. So there, that is, but I uh, I think it would be be interesting to see if bats are exposed in 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 our region too, for sure. And it's a really good question. Yeah, you know that. Um, just to chime in, John and I are very active in, in bats and studying bats, our local bats, and um, we haven't heard anything. But Lindsay is stating a study out of New Zealand has shown that bats are profoundly affected. I would think those would be fruit bats, so they might be. You know, their sources of uh, that's just my comment. Their sources mm -hmm. of food are different, so. And it was actually Lindsay, to her credit, that sent that comment was the oh, one that okay, yeah. brought They're that. Insectivores. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. <laughs> have to travel to New Zealand, check it out myself there, Lindsay. Um, uh, from, pa let's see. Oh, Daryl is asking. Daryl is a fellow with the pine cisk and, just, you know, throwing the seeds. stuff. He's asking uh, where the good nature traps can be uh, purchased locally. Um, they, they have to be ordered online. Um, but they um, they have a north sorry yeah North American distributor and um, so they and they come quite fast actually I ordered for the study that I'm doing right now uh, they came within a week so yeah. they're not cheap yeah no those are the carbon dioxide ones right yeah so what, how they work is that they um, they it's a bolt trap so it's um, the bolt gets triggered by the rat and it dies instantly. Um, but the key here is it self resets it's it's sort of it's because of the co2 cylinder it can self reset itself so that's not very complicated uh but um so it can trigger up to 24 times so unlike a snap trap you don't have to reset the trap it does it and um they're 
designed in such a way that the rat falls down um, and so that a new rat can then access. Um, I think the, my experience with them is that I'm, I'm, I'm sort of in the pre preliminary stages of the project is it's really, really important to assess where the rats are, where they feel comfortable feeding. Um, so th there's, there is a little bit of detective work that goes in before you put up these um, traps, um, bolt traps, because um, unlike bait stations, they're not, you know, they, they don't provide the box for the rat to eat in, where the rat can feel safe. They're, they're more out in the open. So it's good to do a bit of detective work to figure out where the rats are going. And, and if you buy one, you actually get a package of, of how to kind of, there's some other stuff that goes with it that will help you determine where the rats will be comfortable to eat, eat the, or check out the, the trap. There is, there is one. John's uh, chiming in here. Yeah. There is a, one big advantage to offset the initial cost of that device. We have a townhouse complex and we have to get a pest management specialist to come and rebate and check the traps that use rhododendrocytes. But with that type of trap, because there's no chemicals involved, we could install the trap ourselves, saving the cost of bringing out a pet pest management person. And because the rat then is killed mechanically rather than chemically, it provides food for owls that's non-destructive. So the initial cost may be high, but the cost savings of being able to do that ourselves should be factored into that. Um, Pam is just commenting, if you're going to use those good nature traps, you should get some squirrel guards. Otherwise, <laughs> unless you're out after the squirrels at the same time, I suppose, but <laughs> good point. Yeah, you can add some meshing on them so that I guess the squirrels can't get in. Um, the, um, just another comment there too, uh, just as a reference, there's a couple of strata buildings that are gone to using to not using rodenticides in North Van, and I wanted I checked with them just to get an estimate of well how much more expensive is it per resident to to do that, and it, it came to uh, a dollar a year per resident to go from chemical to non-chemical rodenticide extra yeah. dollar a year extra. So I don't it's the cost to change from chemical to to non-chemical is if you divide it on number of residents is, is quite minimal. That's a good thing to know. Yeah. Um, so we have a question from Jane. Uh, she, she says, is this kind of trap called a bolt trap? I may not be hearing it correctly. Yeah, sorry, I, I call it a bolt trap because it triggers a bolt, but I, I guess the product name is uh, the good nature trap. Yeah, so it is, you are saying B-O-L-T, because the yes. action is, is a bolt. Yeah. Yes. So you were hearing but, but, it correctly, yeah. Jane. <laughs> um, Victoria has a comment. First of all, she's pro owl. So we'll look forward to seeing the barn owl box in your backyard, Victoria. <laughs> um, she says, I have a rat elect electrocutor type thing, 6D cell batteries, works. I use it in my shed only. Mice are not big enough to trigger the zap. Ah. It works well. Nod your head. Actually, actually <laughs> yes, it does. It's, it's called a rat zapper. And it, it yeah. does work really well. And then when a rat, we get a rat in it, we just throw it out in the middle of the lawn and it's gone the next time we look out. Somebody mm -hmm. carries it off. So I, I can recommend them from Rona. That's, that's great. And um, I know that, you know, we have the snap traps, the Victor snap traps, but the, in the picture I showed, but the evolution of snap traps has gone a long way. I know there are ones that are really easy and safe to set now. And, and, um, and there seems to be a lot of different versions of, of them out there too. So I, I think, yeah, the, I think when it comes to rats, the more methods you have at hand, the, the better, because they, they, they'll suss things out. And, and if you can, like you say, if you have a sap, the sap trap, if you have various snap traps alongside the preventative and the cultural controls, uh, I, that will also easily go a long way in, in controlling the rats. Pam, Pam just has a comment, Pamela. Uh, the BCSPCA doesn't endorse the electro trap because it doesn't always kill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there's, there's also a question from Pamela, just a little bit up, uh, Christina, um, in case you missed that one about 
the uh, any evidence here that the backcountry illegal grow operations are using SGARs? Um, think she's thinking of issues with uh, fishers in uh, California where I think they were eating the bait directly. Could you comment on that? Yes, um, that is an issue in, in California and it, it doesn't seem like it's subsided with legalization either. Um, the fact it's that um, in community forests, um, I believe state forests too, um, that uh, there's illegal grow ups um, and it's, they're quite, um, I would say as grow ups are fairly well managed, obviously some cartels and um, and um, and again, uh, a, a lot of you know the forest service is understaffed, and what happens there is that they're they're able to in these community forests have these legal grow ups, and what they do is, but I mean they don't read labels, I mean, <laughs> so they just throw this rodenticide around the plants. Um, if you look it up online, you can see pictures of it, and and, and unfortunately, um, a lot of wildlife because it is directly in the forest directly consumes. Uh, this bait um, to the extent that it's not only been found in fishers but it's also been detected in, in spotted owls uh, and also barred owls so it, yeah it's it's a, a really big concern and it's um, it's it's a tricky issue because it's not you know it's not like you can just go and talk to any of these people either it's you're dealing with cartels and layers and layers of criminal activity thank you Sophie uh, doesn't seem to be any other questions at this point, so we probably should start to wrap up. Was there anything else that you wanted to share with us before we wrap up this evening? Um, not really. I, I again, thank you so much for for listening to me, and and I think uh, I think the advocacy work is really really important. Um, I, I I certainly could be better on that than than what I am. I'm, I'm a little bit in the stone ages when it comes to sort of the social media stuff and, and and I think it's thanks to that the the uh, it, it's thanks to people doing the advocacy work over the last year that this has become more uh, it has come to the attention to the public so I think it's great that municipalities are, are taking this on and and and, um, and I think also hopefully there will that will trickle up and, and there'll be pressure uh, on the provincial level too to make some changes because I, I think we, we do need them. So thank, thank, you. Work. thank you. Ryan, back to you. Okay. Oh, thank you, Christina. Thank you. Excellent job. Superstar. John, I think you're uh, I think you're on the alpha now. I think uh, Christina's gonna take over your off. <laughs> so uh, ju just kidding. Um, uh, Sophie, thank you so very much. Um, okay. I will now hand over uh, back to Victoria, who will uh, officially thank uh, Sophie for um, her, her presentation this evening. And then, uh, then we'll wrap up and uh, have a good night. So thanks, Victoria. Okay, well, this is going to be really brief because I think um, Sophie has been thanked multiple times. <laughs> I, actually, I can't even see you on the screen here. Oh, there you are. Thanks so much, Sophie. It's really, really been fabulous that you've been able to uh, explain this so very, very eloquently and clearly. Um, you know, like Christina, this has had a really big impact on me. Certainly when you spoke to us eight years ago, I mean, that was the first time I'd heard about the problem with these rodenticides, but things really have progressed. And although you um, rather modestly say that, uh, you know, it's the um, social media, the people, you know, promoting it, um, the people who can do that without the science behind it uh, they can't do it and you're getting the science so that's a really really valuable role that you're doing and uh, we really really appreciate it so thanks again well, thank you it's, it's always been a pleasure to uh, connect with you Victoria over the years so I, I appreciate it and it's, it's nice to see everyone uh, over the internet <laughs> Thank you, okay, well, we'll 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 say good night, so everybody can uh, is welcome to leave the meeting, and um, I will discuss with Sophie how far she wants uh, this link um, propagated. We didn't actually discuss that yet, but I will talk with you privately, Sophie. Okay. okay. Do, do, do you want me to just hang on, or do you want me? Do you want to do that? Uh, sure. Why not? Okay. Why not?
Great. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, all.